Welcome back everyone to the Allen School's Molecular Programming Seminar Series. And joining us today is Professor Luca Cardelli from the University of Oxford. Uh, Luca has been a prominent figure in numerous areas of computer science, including programming languages, concurrency and the like. And I have to say that the molecular programming community has been very lucky that Luca also became interested in programmable biology and nanotechnology in general. Um, and I believe today's talk is really gonna showcase nicely how um, you know, using different areas of computer science like programming languages are really helping us to better understand and to program matter itself. And I'll also mention that the Allen School has been lucky to have Luca as a frequent collaborator, uh, in particular, the Seelig Lab. So after his PhD, Luca did a tour through uh, industrial research labs where he worked at Bell Labs, Murray Hill, uh, then Digital Equipment Corporation Research in Palo Alto. Uh, and then at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, UK, where he was the head of programming principles, tools, and also security group. Uh, and to my delight, I showed up one day to my office at Oxford, and one morning I found Luca in the office next door, where he is now uh, a Royal Society Research Professor. So Luca holds numerous international awards and fellowships, including being a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, fellow of the ACM, and numerous others. He's also a Tulip uh, Rosenberg Award winner in DNA computation. Um, and I'll say just one last thing, we hosted our kind of main conference in DNA computing uh, at the Allen School a couple of years ago and everyone was crowded around Luca's phone and it wasn't because he had the newest phone out. Um, it was kind of an early prototype of what I believe you'll hear about today. Welcome, Luca. Great, okay, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Uh, so I want to talk today about uh, integrating um, and automating uh, the, the scientific methods uh, uh, using both uh, models and protocols. Um, so the outline is, uh, first of all, a brief description of a scientific method and, and automation. And then we talk about the models that know nothing about protocols. Then we'll look at uh, chemical reaction methods for that in particular. And then we'll talk about lab protocols that know nothing about models. And we'll uh, briefly discuss digital microfluidics. And then we'll talk about integration of these two things and closed loop modeling and, and protocol execution. And I will illustrate all that with the Kimika app uh, towards the end. Uh, but first, I want to discuss the principle behind uh, uh, behind this reasoning. So Kimika is an app you can get from all the app stores, all, all the four major ones. And it gives you an integrated language for chemical models and experimental protocols. It does all the simulation and stochastic simulation. Uh, there are some graph nice graphical rendering of reaction networks, functional scripting, graphic user interface, and so on. So we will see this. Uh, halfway through the, uh, the talk. Uh, but uh, uh, so first I want to start with the uh, overview of what where we're trying to get at. So the scientific method in its automation. Uh, this is the cycle of discovery, observation, and, and hypothesis formulation that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, but just to stress the point, in the, uh, in the old days, uh, you know, when, when the thing got started with Galileo and some people before him, um, the basic it was uh, one guy that did all, all the cycle. He would make, make a certain observation, think of interesting questions, formulate hypotheses, uh, develop predictions, gather data by throwing stuff off the top of Pisa, um, and develop in general theories of gravity and so on, uh, and physics, uh, and, and then eventually publishing. So he was doing all of that in his, uh, in his own time. Um, and of course, this uh, kind of method does not scale up when you have uh, complicated physical systems to study. So if you zoom to the to the 2000s, now the typical unit of scientific discovery is not a single person anymore, but it's a whole lab of people. And this may be a few PIs, maybe 30, 30 to 300 postdocs over 30 years or so. So this is the unit that typically will study one protein or a few proteins uh, over, over their life cycles. And again, they go through the same cycle of observation, positive formulation, and so on. Um, and again, this one does not scale up because even just humans have over, uh, for sure, more than 20,000 proteins. And so if you need one lab like this for each protein, it's not going to end very soon. So the idea to fix that is to automate as much as possible. So, and of course, there's automation in all the different branches of science and technology. Uh, we have uh, automated sequencing. Uh, the, there is uh, efforts to do automa automated uh, scientific discovery from hypothesis uh, and, 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 and robotic uh, experiments. And um, there's also data gathering done uh, automatically. Uh, there's also AI now that can try to infer theories uh, uh, automatically. 
And uh, all these different pieces, they, they work more or less on their own. And the idea is that eventually we can then hook them all together and close the whole cycle uh, completely automatically, presumably, hopefully. And so just as a little joke, it would look like this. Instead of, a, instead of a lab, we just have one program that does the whole job. And the program is well through predict and falsify and go through the loop until, until you reach convergence. So, so this is the kind of future that uh, you know, ideally we want, to, we want to envision. But there is a more kind of uh, achievable goal, which is to look at the inner loop of uh, scientific discovery. So there is an outer loop, which is the, the grand theories. But once you have a theory, and, and you do some experiments, and basically I iterate locally to refine the theory and, and refine the experiments. And this kind of uh, inner loop is very easy to auto, conceptually to automate. So let's concentrate on, on this inner loop. So there is a, there is a model that you are hypothesizing. There is a, a, a protocol to test the model in the lab, and there's a system that you're testing. And the problem right now is that all these three things have flaws. Uh, the models are typically not just differential equations, they, well, eventually they are, but they're written like usually poorly maintained MATLAB scripts that are difficult to understand and, and, and read. Um, protocols are purely described manual steps in the lab. There are lists of instructions, but you know, they vary, they also may vary from, from the person executing them. And the systems themselves, especially in biology, in physics it's okay, but in biology, the systems are not resettable. Uh, you cannot start from known conditions. So that's also a big problem. So the combination of all of this is causing a crisis in biology, where experiments are done basically once they're very hard to reproduce. And there are nature article, uh, and articles explaining why this is a problem. Of course, it, it's a problem because scientific method requires the traceability. Uh, so what we want to do is automate all these steps. We want to do ver model verification by protocols. We want to uh, use protocols to observe systems automatically. And we want to do automatic falsification of systems to get to, to new models to, to iterate. And uh, so the models, we would like them to be an ambiguous mathematical description, not, not MATLAB script or some kind of an ambiguous description. And this is done in computational biology, but you know, like SBML languages in some degree uh, try to achieve that. Uh, protocols, we also want to standardize the protocols and use engineered uh, uh, standard parts. This is really almost synthetic biology. Uh, the system, we want to characterize them properly. And so they're like organized foundries that try to establish well, 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 well understood uh, cell lines that you can use and reuse uh, over and over again. And for the arcs of this diagram, we want to use verification, observation, statistical inference, all these automated techniques. These are pretty much all done in software at this point. Uh, and there are also life cycle issues like uh, uh, performance evaluation of these models, of optimization, Management because you want to keep all the whole the whole system consistent and, and well documented, and to know you know who's done what and when. So these are typical version control issues. Uh, but you can imagine that all this uh, you know eventually will work out, and so we're trying to build towards that. Now in this talk, in particular, I will concentrate on uh, uh, molecular programming as a way of going around these loops, um, and in particular, the models will be chemical reaction models, chemical reaction network models. And the protocols will be DNA nanotech uh, protocols. And uh, at least in this in kind of this small framework, we can, I think, see how to uh, possibly automate and close this loop in a fairly effective way. So let's start talking about models. Um, uh, as I said, that we're going to take chemical reaction networks. Uh, why that? Well, because uh, they are interesting in many different ways. First of all, they were invented as a phenomenological uh, uh, method for investigating natural systems. So just a way of recording what happens in nature. So you, you look at nature, look what reactions happen in nature, and you write them down. This is phenomenology. Um, but you can also use a, a programming language to, to write programs that execute also in the, in the physical chemical world. Uh, first of all, you can, you can think of uh, uh, your genome as a program that somehow encodes a chemical system, so encodes chemical reactions. And this genome program is finite. There's only so much DNA that you have. And so it's definitely a program. And but it's able to express a huge richness of, of behavior because from the genes, everything comes. Um, so, so if you have a, a chemical programming language, you can express a, a high, huge variety of, of behavior in nature. A chemical reaction network is also a very well understood mathematical structure, which has been rediscovered in many forms. There is called Special addition systems, petri nets, uh, bounded context free languages, population protocols, 
they're all more or less uh, vaguely the same idea that you can summarize as a chemical reaction network. Um, in all of these uh, chemical reaction networks are a, a description of mechanism of what instructions are executed in a, in a, in a system uh, rather than behavior. You know, behavior means what equations are satisfied by the system. So they are description of mechanisms. So they're more detailed than just a bunch of differential equations. They also explain how the system achieves its, uh, its, its result. So they're interesting because also there's also this mechanistic aspect of them. So as an example, I'm going to just briefly highlight uh, a, a, an interesting program, which is a, a chemical infinite loop, uh, which has taken basically 100 years to implement. Uh, so uh, in the old days, chemists did not think that uh, artificial chemical systems could oscillate. They thought everything would get just dampen out eventually and, and, and stop. And they thought that maybe only living systems have this property of continuous like cell, cellular replication and oscillation indefinitely. But in 1920, Locke uh, showed a very simple chemical system. So there are two differential equations, but he was really thinking about the chemical reactions behind this. Um, so you can you can represent the chemi as chemical reactions, and these two uh, these two differential equations exhibit an indefinite oscillation, and that was a novelty at the time. Uh, so this is the first theoretical proof that chemical systems can actually oscillate in principle. And in his mind, you know, X one and X two they are not actual specific chemicals; they are just two variables. So he didn't know what chemicals to use to to implement this oscillator, but you could see that uh, this dynamical system would, would oscillate indefinitely. It so happens that the next year, uh, uh, a guy called Bray accidentally discovered a chemical oscillator like this, but nobody believed him because they thought that nobody believed that chemicals could oscillate. So he was forgotten for like 40 years, almost 40 years before somebody else discovered another thing. So in 1926, uh, Voltaire wrote his book on, uh, on ecological systems. And he had in one of the systems had exactly the same ODEs as Lotka. So it's now called the Lotka Volterra system. And Volterra was thinking about rabbits, not chemicals, but it's basically the same dynamical system. So finally, in 1958, um, again, accidentally, a new oscillator was discovered called the busy oscillator, chemical oscillator. It's very famous. You could demonstrate it in the lab very easily. And it was very, it became very, very famous. Uh, in 1963, Lawrence, discover a chaotic oscillator. Now this takes three of these instead of two. Um, and they can also can be adapted. It's not mass action, but can be adapted for mass action. And now we have a more interesting oscillator, one which is even chaotic. chaotic. And the first deliberately designed chemical oscillator uh, in, experimentally was done in 1981. In 2005, they had a first biological experimental oscillator done by proteins and ATP uh, with the circadian clock from, from biological materials. And the first synthetic uh, oscillator from DNA was in 2017 uh, done by et al. So, so as you can see, even just a, a very simple system like an oscillator uh, chemically can, can be very interesting as a, as a program, even just building an infinite loop. Um, now, you can think of these uh, uh, chemical reactions behind this oscillator as a program in, in, in a sense that we'll now explain. So we have the local Volterra ODEs. These are equations. But you can extract uh, chemical reactions in a systematic way called Hungarian It's an algorithm. Uh, basically, you cut each monomial of the, of the reaction, each monomial of the ODEs, each monomial becomes one reaction. So you have four monomial, four reactions. And this reaction you can, you can read fairly easily. This reaction says that the prey, which is X1, so X1 is the prey through the predator, the prey increases automatically, but just, like, they're eating grass and reproducing. So from one X1, you get two X1. The second reaction says the predators uh, uh, decrease the prey, so they eat them. So if you have a prey and predator, you get only a predator, meaning it has eaten the prey. The third reaction says the prey increases the predators uh, because you have uh, uh, the, uh, the prey uh, doesn't change, but the predator in presence of prey reproduce. And the fourth reaction says the predators die out, especially if the third reaction cannot happen, then the predators do not find prey to eat, and so therefore they die out in the fourth reaction. So this now becomes a mechanistic model of this kind of equational system, right? Uh, and there's this algorithm to go from, from the equations to the, uh, which I'm not going to describe, but it's an easy algorithm to go from the equations to the reactions. But it's a little bit funny because uh, as you can see, uh, there's this, the second reaction says the predators decrease, and the third reaction says the prey, uh, prey um, pr uh, predator uh, increase, uh, sorry, the prey decrease, and the third reaction says the predator increase. And they're kind of decoupled. But if you think of interaction between predators, we like to think of uh, you know, one eating the other. 
So you may want to write a reaction like this one that says if a prey and a predator meet, then the prey disappears and the predator doubles, means, means it has reproduced. So uh, now let's make an assumption that these two rates, these are the rates of the reaction. Suppose that B, A2 is equal to B1. And so in this case, is it legal to replace these two reactions with kind of decoupled interactions with a single reaction, which is this coupled interaction between the, the species? Is it okay to replace this reaction with this one? But to answer this question is actually quite simple. You just compute the, the meaning uh, of this uh, uh, chemical system in terms of differential equations. So there is, a, there is an inverse algorithm going from chemical reaction to ODEs, which is called the mass action uh, meaning of the reactions. So you look at the reactions, you look at the mass action law, the law of mass action, you apply it and you get the differential equations. So if we have two uh, chemical systems, we can apply the mass action law to both of them. And if you take this uh, system with three reactions where we replace the middle two with a single one, you can compute that it gives you exactly the same ODEs as the original one. So the answer is yes. Assuming A2 is going to be one, then this uh, program with four instructions is equivalent to this program with three instructions. So in this sense, I mean, I say that uh, chemical reactions are programs and there is a notion of uh, equivalence uh, through differential equations by which you can investigate the meaning, the meaning and equivalence of these programs. Um, so, uh, so now we have this programming language in a sense, the chemical reactions. And the question is how, how expressive it is. Well, it is very expressive. In fact, you can program any dynamical system or technically any elementary dynamical system, but elementary does not mean elementary at all. It's, it's actually very complicated. It's a mathematical term. Uh, so basically any dynamical system you can ever come across, you can program it as a, as a CRN uh, directly without any approximations. Okay, so for example, let's look at the oscillation, the typical oscillator sine cosine. This can be written as two differential equations, these two, this will give you sine and cosine. Um, and uh, the problem here is that the you know, oscillator like sine and cosine goes negative. So we cannot implement negative quantities with chemical species. They never, they're always positive. So we need to find a way around that. We can, you can, uh, what we can do is to split each, spe each uh, variable, which can go negative into two chemical species, which are both positive, but then we look at the difference. So we can call the difference, the negative values are different of positive values. So this, uh, again, it's an algorithm. You can split uh, uh, each variable into two and we get a system now of four differential equations. We can now have four variables. Um, and if we apply our previous algorithm, which is to get the chemical reactions out of these differential equations, we get four, uh, yeah, four monomials, four chemical reactions. If you, if you uh, simulate these reactions, you get exactly uh, uh, the original oscillation. And what, I, what you're plotting here is the difference of two species. So this difference, it can go negative and you get exactly the same graph that you uh, at the beginning. So this is to show that this chemical program here can, can implement even something that looks like you couldn't do because it goes negative and oscillates and so on. So it's an example of how to systematically compile a dynamical system to a, to a, a chemical program. And then you can also go further and, and implement this chemical system with DNA. And then you can hopefully actually run this in a lab. So the steps are as follows. First, uh, the first step is called polynomization. So you take a, a, an element, a, a system of differential equations, which may contain weird things like uh, trigonometry exponentials, fractions, uh, inverses. Um, so fractions will give you heel kinetics, for example, um, and, and polynomials. So you can take this very complicated system of differential equations and algorithmically you can convert it to a system which is just polynomials. So you get rid of all this trigonometry and so on. You just get a system of polynomials. That's the first step. Second step, you positivize the variable. So you look at the differences to remove the negative quantities. The first step, you, well, it's automatic. It turns out that all positivized ODs are automatically Hungarian, which means you can convert them to chemical reactions. So the, there's nothing to do in this step. So the next step is to convert uh, ODs to chemical reactions. That's the Hungarization algorithm, which I mentioned. And the fourth step is uh, hopefully to use molecular programming to compile those to, uh, to DNA and, and run that into the lab. So this is the procedure that you can follow. So uh, in this year, chemistry is also so it's an observational phenomenological system for, for, for science, but it's also a formal language that we can use to implement any dynamical system with real DNA molecules. Um, and this is uh, the idea for that we're describing in this paper here. So this is now approaching the situation where you can automatically compile any kind of dynamical system into, into chemical uh, methods you can actually run.
So automation is, uh, is beginning to look feasible in this direction. So what is a model in this specific sense? Uh, so a model for us would be a, a bunch of DNA uh, strands uh, shown by, uh, by these diagrams here. So each, each diagram is a, is a chemical species, which is a, is a DNA is a strand or a double strand. And these are now chemical reactions between these chemical species, which are DNA strands. And these reactions obey the, the laws of DNA strand displacement, so they're all feasible. And so this is a model, a chemical reaction model, where the species are, are DNA uh, st structures, and the kinetics is given by running uh, DNA strand displacement reactions uh, over those structures. And this you can run in, in a test tube at least. So this is what a model looks like in this uh, in this world. Now these models have a, have a meaning. And the meaning is uh, given by the chemical rationality, you get the differential equation. Then for differential equation, you can integrate them numerically or symbolically or whatever. And you get the meaning of, the, of your system, mean, uh, meaning that you can compute at any given time t what the concentrations of the species will be. So that's the meaning of the, of the, of the model. And this is given by integration of the, of the differential equations. So you take the, the chemical reaction method, which are species and reactions, you, you compute the flux which is the right hand side of the differential equations for that chemical reaction network. And once you have the flux, you integrate the flux, uh, and that gives you a function which can tell at, at any point, at any time t, what will be the concentration of all the species in your, in your model. So that's how you compute uh, uh, the model, and that's what, what the model means, uh, means, uh, means these concentrations. So summarizing this part, so our models are chemical programs. We can compute their behavior, meaning we can compute the final state. Uh, we can run them virtually through integration of the differential equations, and we can also run them physically with some you know, experimental caveats uh, using DNA nanotechnology. So next I want to talk about protocols, uh, protocols that know nothing about models. So this would be for us, again, in the DNA world, uh, chemical world, a protocol. You have some test tubes who contain DNA strands, like this one, this one, this one, and that one, they're all DNA strands. And you do a liquid handle operations, mixing these test tubes. Like this is a mix operation. You mix two test tubes and you get a new test tube. And now this uh, will contain the, the union of these two. So this one actually sticks to that. So when you mix them, you form this new structure here. Then you have a, yeah, and this will be your gate for some kind of computation. Then you have an input for this gate, which is given by this test tube here. You mix it again, and this will do some reaction. And then you mix with another input and you get more reaction and you eventually get some, some result here that you are trying to achieve. So these are all liquid handling operations and the operations are typically, you start from a, from a sample from a test tube with some known quantities. You can mix them, you can split them. So the dispense means uh, split them in, some, in two or more parts. You can let them rest, equilibrate, so let, let the system evolve by its own rules. And then if you want, you can throw away some of, some of the parts you don't care about. And so this is now a, a particular protocol with a sequence of steps uh, using these, these instructions that hopefully achieve some, some result that you're hoping for in your experiment. Now, this kind of protocols can be run uh, in an automated way, for example, with digital magnetic So this is a situation where you have a, an array of electrodes and the test tubes are not test tubes, but they're, they're vesicle, they're, they're droplets containing chemicals. And these droplets can be uh, moved and mixed and merged and split. Um, in various ways. And so each of, each of these steps, which are described in this uh, uh, diagram here in this protocol, that can be automated and implemented by this kind of uh, devices under, under software control. And you have uh, this open drop is an open source uh, implementation of this. You can download the hardware schematics and build it yourself. And, and UW has a, its own uh, version called Purple, Purple Drop. So digital Mathematics is very nice because it's a general programmable platform to execute all the main liquid handling operations. And you can also couple it with external equipment. So you can, you can inject uh, new droplets from pumps and you can extract droplets from other pumps. And then you can send these droplets to be analyzed by mass specs or, or by sequencing. And, and hopefully you can close the loop and get the analysis of those droplets uh, to cause some synthesis of new DNA. And then the new DNA gets fed back into the microfluidic device and so on. So you can imagine again, an automated uh, closed cycle system uh, where, where all is done uh, without touching anything in the lab, just done automatically by the, by the equipment. Um, so how do we program these protocols? Well, uh, basically you need to codify, you know, there are, there are many 
proprietary you know, protocol languages. Uh, each each kind of automated piece of lab equipment comes basically with its own little protocol language or, or some form or another. Uh, so here I'm describing very abstract ones. It comes from, from this paper here. So in this very, very schematic protocol language, we have a uh, uh, sample. So a sample is like a test tube or a droplet. The sample contains uh, chemicals. It has certain concentrations of chemicals. It has a volume and it has a temperature. Uh, so those are basic uh, features. And the, the language for, for programming samples is uh, uh, variables denote samples. Uh, there, there are, there are you know, initial sample conditions. So there's initial concentration, initial volume, initial temperature. And then you can, uh, you can name a sample uh, just as convenience. And these are the actual operation. You can mix two samples to get a new sample and get a new sample P. You can split the sample uh, P1 into a proportion P between zero and one. Uh, and then you get two subsamples X, X and Y. And then you can use these two subsamples into the rest of the protocol P2 that you're going to run after that. Uh, you can also equilibrate, uh, meaning let, let the sample rest and execute its own instructions for some time T. And if you want, you can throw away a sample. So these are all recursive, so you can you can use these uh, operations recursively and, and mix and split and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this, uh, this is a very schematic language of liquid handling also has a, has a meaning, has a semantics. And the semantics is given by what happens when you mix things. So for example, to give an example, suppose we have a, the mix uh, operation that takes two sub protocols, P1 and P2, and uh, it produces the protocol which is mixing P1 and P2. So suppose that the sub protocol P1 produces this sample here with concentration X1, volume V1, and temperature T1. And the sub protocol P2 produces this uh, uh, sample X2, V2, T2. Now, what would be the result of mixing these two uh, subsamples we got from two sub protocols? Well, the volume of, the of mixing is the sum of the volumes, obviously. And the, um, the concentration would be the weighted average weighted by the, the volumes of the two samples. And also the temperature would be the weighted averages of the temperature of the two samples. So this tells you uh, what, what is the meaning of mixing two samples. And similarly, you can do the same kind of computation for, uh, for splitting. In this case, when you split, uh, the concentrations do not change. Uh, the volumes get split by proportionally and the temperatures do not change. So it's that all very easy. Uh, but there are two missing pieces which I will fill in later, uh, which tell, will tell you what happens when it equilibrates and, and so on. But the basic protocol language is a very simple semantic, which is, uh, again, you can compute the result of the protocol if you know the initial conditions of all your samples. Now, Kimika, the, the app, uh, gives you a way to simulate these kind of protocols. Uh, and it's sim simulating them as digital microfluidics uh, virtual device. Uh, so they're droplets, and you will, I will show an animation in a little bit, where you can run the, the protocols like uh, split and mix and dispose, and the, the droplets will move around and will compute the result of the, of, of the simulation. Uh, so summarizing, again, this part, our protocols are programs. They are liquid handling programs. We can compute their behavior, their final state by the, the semantics I showed you. Uh, we can run the virtual by simulators, and we can also run them physic physically by the digital microfluidics. So now let's, let's look at models together with protocols. So we want again automate the whole thing, the whole the whole, whole closed loops. Uh, so protocols are sets of steps to direct lab machinery or people to do things, and models are set of equations to predict the results of lab experiments. But protocols know nothing about models. There is nothing in a in a in a protocol that tells you what model you're testing. And similarly, there is nothing in the model that tells you what protocol you should be using uh, to test the model. But they're both trying to talk about the same system, the same physical uh, uh, experiment. So, uh, so there is, again, reproducibility crisis uh, because all these things are decoupled and written in different places. Uh, experiments are difficult to reproduce because there are different materials, different conditions, different shortcuts, different, different labs doing different things, different people doing different things. Even the models, uh, believe it or not, are hard to reproduce. There are all, always types in equations, in published equations, always. Um, there are always sketchy diagrams, especially in biology papers. There are always unexplained graphs. There are always mysterious scripts in the observer material. So reproducing model, it's always a, a, a considerable task, which usually involves talking to the postdoc to figure out what, what happened there. Uh, so we would like to, this to work better and to be more automated and, and, and sensible. Uh, so we want to, uh, the documentation of the models and the protocols to go together with the models and the protocols and not get decoupled from them. Uh, so this is uh, why I try to design a, a, an integrated description, which is a, 
unified, which it contains the whole the whole uh, situation. And uh, and this is the same uh, uh, language we just saw. It has uh, sample variables, initial conditions, uh, mix, split, and dispose, but also equilibrate. And equilibrate in equilibrate comes the meaning, the chemical meaning of the of the protocol, because equilibrate in, implies some some chemical reactions happening, which gives the meaning of the of our chemical system. Uh, so, uh, so, so now this is a unified description in the sense that from this unified description we can extract the protocol. If you just look, uh, if you forget equilibrium, just look at the, the liquid handling steps, you can basically derive this uh, diagram, which is your protocol diagrams. But also, if you look at the uh, chemical reaction network, which underlying the equilibrates, you can extract the model, uh, the chemical model of the system. So we want to have this whole this whole thing into unified uh, uh, language, if you want, a unified script. And, and, and because of that, we want to have this unified semantics uh, that is basically just filling the, the pieces we've seen before. We have the semantics of the protocol, but now we're slotting in the semantics of the, of the, of the chemical reaction network given by integration. And now this is all recursive. So you can have equilibrate inside of mixing, mix inside of equilibrate, and the whole thing you can compute what happens uh, precisely, or at least simulate what happens precisely uh, when you mix all these all this steps together. And you are going to get in the end uh, uh, concentrations for your uh, species, uh, no matter whether it's been equilibrated or mixed or split or whatever. So, so we have uh, a joint semantics, which means we also have a joint simulation algorithm connecting the chemical simulation and the protocol simulation. Now, what, in this presentation, the semantics is pretty easy. It's all deterministic. What Kinica actually does, it does a stochastic uh, algorithm. So it's combining stochastic simulation for the chemical reaction network with the stochastic propagation of the of the, of the variances for the for liquid handling steps, and it's all uh, you know feeding feeding into each other uniformly. Um, so Kimika uses Lyrano's approximation, which is an ODE-based technique. It's not a Gillespie; it's an ODE-based technique which cannot be applied to any chemical system, it's no restrictions, um, and that's why it's, it's so nice. Um, and can compute the mean and variance uh, of concentrations of all the chemical species. And also, we can uh, extend the uh, the classical LNA Lyranos approximation for chemical systems to uh, to liquid handling steps and cause propagation of means and variances across uh, mixing and splitting of of uh, of, of, of uh, samples. Uh, so, what is this all good for? Well, uh, this at the moment I'm just we're basically doing simulations, but this also will be useful. To ask questions such as what is the probability of a certain outcome given uncertainties in both the protocol and the model? Because usually you have uncertainty in the model parameters, like the rates of the reactions. You also have uncertainty in the protocol parameters, like uh, pipetting or, or splitting things uh, as uncertainties. And so the result of your experiment depends on all these uncertainties together. So you may want to ask what is the probability of reaching some, some uh, outcome given all these uncertainties, or conversely, uh, given a certain outcome. Uh, how do I, what, what kind of inference do I do to figure out what the parameters are for both the protocol and the, and the model that makes sense for this particular outcome? Uh, another thing you can do is to use statistical model checking, which is a, another simulation based technique. You basically run the simulation many times and see what kind of statistics you get. And for example, you can see what statistics you get when you have uncertainty in the, uh, in the chemical model, this is in red, or uncertainty in the, in the protocol, this is in yellow. Or when you have uncertainty in all of them, that, that's the blue. And then you can figure out uh, how much uncertainty you have in your um, model. Uh, so um, now I'm going to start describing a little bit Kimika. So um, let's see how this works out in practice in this, uh, this simulator. So this is a prototype, prototype language for chemical models and protocols. So again, there are apps uh, you can download. Um, and uh, the main features are there are uh, basic uh, uh, fundamental notions of species and reaction, which are you know, based into the language. It's a programming language, but species and reactions are base types in a sense. They're, they're first class things. Uh, so species are characterized by initial values, reactions are characterized by rates and, and their, their kinetics. Uh, and there are samples, I mean compartments. Uh, samples contain chemical species at certain concentrations. And there are protocols that manipulate samples, uh, like mixing and splitting. There is a uh, kinetics and simulation that the deterministic ODEs or stochastic uh, ODEs for, for chemical models. And there's a digital microfluidic simulation for, for protocols. And around all this, there, is, there are modern programming abstractions. So you can actually 
program sophisticated scripts that do lots of interesting things on top of this uh, basic functionality of chemical reactions and, and proper of steps. So as an example, let's look at the local Volterra, which you've seen before. So in, uh, in first of all, notice that uh, we can write the reaction in natural notation. So they, they just look like chemical reactions, although this is the programming language. Um, and if, uh, but in this case, this just this only has the reactions at the initialization of the species. And the initial values are actually taken from uh, uniform distribution. So they, they change every time around the script. Uh, this is uh, how to control the, the plotting, and this is uh, equilibrate. So this means run, run the simulation for 40 seconds. So if I run the script, then I get uh, a simulation. Uh, and if I run again, I get a different simulation because it's uh, sampling from random initial values. Uh, and here you can see the schema schematic description of the reactions, which I'll describe in a second. But the reactions are this one and that one. You can see in orange and that one. Um, and so this is how, so the, the, uh, the app is a single window, at least in the uh, Windows, in Windows and Mac OS is a single, it's a single window. Uh, and there are some menus on the side right, to get uh, some scripts and some control over, over the output and so on. Uh, so um, what can we see here? Well, first of all, I want to explain this uh, graphical notation for reaction, which is kind of interesting to me, at least. Um, so it, it's a new graphical representation of chemical reaction networks because it, they're very difficult to, to draw and they're very messy when you draw them as graphs. So this is a new style of representation which is almost like a musical score. So there are score lines and each score line is a, is a species. So A is this, this line is, is a species A, species B, species C, species B. The reactions connect the, the score lines. So this reaction A plus B equals C plus D, A and B are the inputs of the reaction. There's a stem, vertical stem, where they flow and then they flow out to C and D. So this is pretty simple. Uh, this is how uh, two B uh, goes to C plus D will be represented. There are two copies of the, of the B input and then it, it flows into C and D. Now it's getting a bit more sophisticated. This is, uh, if there are no, no outputs in this reaction, then it's, uh, the input just goes to nothing. If there are no inputs to the reaction, then the inputs, basically the, the outputs are generated from nothing and they flow into A and to B. There's also special notation for catalyst. So it, it, uh, A is a catalyst because it, uh, it participates in the reaction, but is not changed by the reaction. It just helps B become C, but A itself is not affected. So catalysts are extracted as these green arrows, green stems. That basically means that A helps B become C, kind of on the side. And again, the special case is if, uh, if A, if the catalyst is the only reactant, then it's drawn like this, meaning that A helps C be produced. If uh, the, the catalyst is the only product, then this is the abbreviation meaning that the C helps A be removed. Um, and there's also autocatalysis where A helps A be produced, which is written like this. So this is basically uh, all the notation. And uh, uh, for comparison, this is a, a more complicated uh, uh, script uh, is a two M oscillator. So if I run this, uh, uh, I get a lot more reactions. Okay, um, and uh, but um, uh, if you compare this with what it would look like uh, as a graph of reactions, this is, so the, the graph is out of the same of the same system of reactions. Here is a, I, I claim it's a little bit easier to figure out what happens, especially, especially if you put things in the right order. If I put, uh, if I go low, mid, and high, uh, if I go low, mid, and high, then and I comp compact it a bit, then low, mid, high. No, this is the wrong high. Low, mid, high. Time. Then there is a there is symmetry here. So this subsystem is symmetrical to that subsystem, and also this uh, system here is symmetrical to that system here. So you can begin to see symmetries in your network, which come from from the reactions. While here to extract symmetries in a graph, it's it's a, it's a big problem. So so the whole, hopefully this is uh, this is helpful. And this uh, in the in the app, this is uh, automatic. It, it it can always produce uh, such a representation for any chemical reaction network. Although sometimes it's a uh, um, well, if it's, if it's a mass action reaction network, it's always this explicit. Um, so this, you will see that in the in the end. So as I was saying, the, there is stochastic simulation. So I can switch to uh, uh, mean and variance. And now it will also plot the, the variance of this, uh, of this oscillator uh, in these uh, shaded areas. And uh, from this, you can extract uh, 
uh, the differential equations from you know this reaction. That it, so you can extract differential equations. You can also extract differential equations for the variances and covariances. And this go, they go on for quite a while because there are six species, which means there are 36 uh, reactions for covariance. But but if you want, you can you can look at all the uh, covariance information, and this is what's used to plot uh, these uh, sugar values. Um, so, so this is the basic uh, chemical simulation ideas, uh, you know, in common with many other systems. You know, around all this, there's a, there's a, a scripting language for, for doing compositional model uh, writing. And uh, the chemical notation is embedded in the language. So let me show you an example, which, which I'll describe in a second, which is the predatorial. So the chemical notation like this reaction here it's just mixed into the into the program. There is no distinction. There is no special quotes or anything. Like that. Just write, write the reactions in the middle of your program. Um, there are rich data types for this kind of program. There are numbers, functions, and lists uh, with expression in programming language. But there are also base types for species, networks, and flows. The flows are trajectories. Um, and there are modern abstractions with a functional language, meaning that programs take data as parameters, where data is any one of these things here, and produce data as results. It's monadic, meaning that uh, this program is functional program, but they produce effects, and the effects are the production of species, uh, the external reaction, and the liquid handling steps. And it's a nominal language, uh, which means that it's lacks the scope, which means you don't you don't get confused with the strings that uh, as, as names of species. Species are species; they are not strings, and, and they're handled properly. Handled properly. As you can see, the this is a species. There is no quotation; it, it's a proper variable. Okay, so um, let's see what we can do with this uh, scripting language. As an example, predatorial is a recursive program, recursive functional program, the recursion is here, uh, which is an iteration of Lotka Volterra. So imagine a stack of N Lotka Volterra uh, systems where each predator is eating the, the predator on the level down, all the way down to the prey at the bottom level. So we want to build this stack of predators. And so we write this program that has the number n of stacks as a parameter. And if n is equal to zero, then there are no predators, they're just, they're just prey. So we define a prey species and we say well, there's the reaction for prey, we just reproduce it. And that's it, there is nothing else. But, but if n is greater than uh, zero, then uh, we define a predator species, which will eat on the, on the prey at the, at the level down. And uh, what is the prey? Well, the prey is the result of predatorial n minus one, is the, is the predator at the next level down. So we, we, call, we call the recursion here to get this, the prey species for this level. And then there are the two local volatile reactions for, uh, for predator. Uh, and then here we say, okay, re, re, report, plot, report means plot. So plot the predator that we just defined here and, and then return it uh, from this function so it can be used by the next predator or the, the way up. Now notice that uh, at each iteration, we define a new predator. They're all called predator, but they get distinguished by, by numberings in the, in, the, in the actual execution. So they're all distinct predator species. So it basically generate, it can generate dynamically species on the fly, which means that the, the chemical system you can produce on the script are unbounded. They have an unbounded number of species and unbounded number of reactions, which is a very uncommon property for, uh, for scripting languages. Okay. So eventually, once we have this, uh, Predator function, we can invoke it with, for example, with five stack, stack of five. And the result is the species, which is the apex predator. And then we can run it uh, for like 50. So in this case, if I, oops, if I run this, uh, then I get also turn off the uh, LNA. So now we get all the, all the different. So the, 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 the red is the, the bottom level tray, which gets eaten a lot. And then all the different levels, and the bottom one is the highest level predator, which is in the, the smallest number. Anyway, so this is a, a, an example of a recursive chemical program using functional programming to, to do the recursion. Uh, and this way you can flexibly script all your... Uh, so the, the parameters here can be, can be numbers, can be species, can be uh, other functions, can be whole networks, uh, can be uh, 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 time courses, flows. Uh, so everything is fully parameterized. Um, okay, now how do we uh, describe samples in this language? So uh, protocols. So samples are characterized by volume and temperature, and uh, uh, they contain a set of species. Uh, they evolve according to the reactions uh, on those species. And each sample isolates the species that it, the reactions operate on. Uh, the process operations, they accept and produce samples. They take samples and produce samples. 
and samples are used up. So uh, it's an operation uses a sample, the sample has been consumed, they cannot be used again by another part of the program. So samples in this uh, particular language are written like this. There's a sample A, which, is a, which has a, a volume and a temperature. Um, there are some species in, in this sample A, or in A, there are the species, the species. There are some amount of some global species in the sample A because you know you want to share species across different samples. So in this case, I just there is an amount of a global species C in this sample A. And then there is a reaction which affects this sample. And similarly, another sample B, oops, um, with uh, which has a, in initial conditions and uh, there's some amount of the global species and it has a reaction. So this is the um, mix and split of sample here. Because uh, uh, sample A, sample B, and then some uh, operations uh, split, mix, and equilibrate. So if I run this now, what happens? Well, first of all, um, I run the first sample. So there is an equilibrate at the end of the first sample. So the simulation starts and then stops after the, this first equilibrate. And now I have the situation inside sample A, the uh, evolution of the chemicals inside sample A. The simulation now is paused. If I if I pause right here, if I click again. Then it execute up to the second equilibrate. Now this is the situation in sample B. In this case, the species are going down. And then if I click again, that's the situation after the third equilibrate, which is in, in the in the sample called E, I think, sample E, which is the mixture of the two previous samples with an additional reaction. Now in sample E, there are three reactions which are active and they form an oscillator. And now you can see the the, the whole uh, kinetics is more interesting. So this is what happens basically each each protocol. As you can see, it can have multiple equilibrate. Each equilibrate is a, is a chemical simulation. And this chemical simulation gets iterated uh, as, you, as you click uh, the button. You can also you know, shift click if you don't want to wait for, for, each, uh, for each one of them. Um, and that's how the, uh, the interleave the simulation of, uh, uh, of uh, um, protocols and, and chemistry works. Uh, so liquid handling is done by this operation mix. Uh, so you can uh, mix B and C into A. Or you split A into B and C by proportion 0 0.5, or you equilibrate B into A for three seconds, or you dispose C and some, some other operation. Um, so, this is the demo I've just made. Uh, and uh, there are some other demos like uh, you can take an actual you know, real protocol, like producing a first state buffer from an online protocol repository. You can code it up into, into Kimika this way. In this case, there is no chemistry, it's just the, the protocol uh, operations. Uh, this is an example of an actual chemical problem, which is serial dilution. Again, it's a recursive protocol. You iteratively dilute the sample more and more and more and more. And you can again build this by by recursion. Um, but what I want to show now is the uh, the digital microfluidics, how this comes in. So for this, we are going to activate the uh, digital microfluidic uh, simulator, and if we run the same uh, program here, it's going to do. Uh, uh, the execute the protocol uh, in the uh, microfluid simulator. So the first uh, the first part was simply to do equilibrate, which meant uh, take the sample, move it to a warm place, let it stay there for a while, run the simulation of the chemical. When this is finished, go back to the uh, uh, initial initial uh, position. If I now do it again, it will do sample B. Sample B says equilibrate, so it has to go to the warm place to equilibrate B. And when it's done with the simulation, it goes back to the initial state. But then there is, oh, there is split and mix. Okay, split and mix are started, and there's some splitting and mix of, the, of the, the droplets. And then it goes to the resting position. And then there's a final equilibrate. And that, again, it goes to the warm uh, location for the equilibrate, and then does the simulation, and then goes back. And then it is really disposed, so it disappears. So this again, how you do the, this integrated uh, uh, simulations of the chemistry and they are interleaving the chemistry and the protocol simulation. So given this, we can actually now extract the information as we mentioned before. So turn this off. Um, various outputs you can look at here. You can look at well, the, the reaction network. You can also look at the, uh, the actual CRN with the reactions or the chemical or the differential equations as you want. You can also extract the, uh, the protocol uh, so these are, these are just the protocol steps of this script without the chemistry. So if you want to see what the protocol in the lab would be, those are the steps. You can also look at this in a graphical format as a graph. So these are uh, graphical steps. So you take A and B, you, you split A into B and C, and you mix this with B and so on and so forth. Um, and you can also look at the more detailed uh, state graph, meaning that uh, 
is the global state of each situation. So initially you have two samples A and B, then you do one operation, now you have sample B and A1. Now you have another operation sample A1 and B1. So this is the global state they're cascading. And if you want the full information of this, uh, um, uh, you, I guess, can do show reactions. Now for each state of this protocol, for each global state of the protocol, it tells you the samples which are in that state, A and B in this case, that's the concentrations in that sample, the reactions are active in that sample, and then the transition to the next state, and then what the next state is, and the concentration, and so on. So this is the full story of the, of the whole thing. And so you see how you extract uh, from the single script both the chemical kinetics and the protocol information uh, that you may want to look at. So this is just uh, laying out uh, what I just showed in the, in the app. Okay, so I want to start concluding. Uh, Kimika has a bunch of extra features, which I'll mention very, very briefly. First of all, it has general kinetic rates, so you can write the uh, um, uh, mathematical expressions as rates in a very free style. Uh, you can use uh, uh, trigonometry exponentials, rational powers, fractions. All that is supported by the uh, stochastic simulation and so on. Um, there are event triggers for this continuous waveform is useful for, for sample inputs. There is direct ODE notation. If you don't want to write chemical reaction, you can write ODEs. It's just that the signal could get converted to, to reactions and then the handle, handle has reactions internally. Um, there are time flows, I meaning trajectories are first class. You can capture them and manipulate them like, like you can average trajectories uh, and you can replot them and so on and so forth. There is a mass action compiler. So I want to talk about that a little bit in a second. Uh, there are programmable random numbers. This is following uh, MIT's Omega probabilistic language very closely. And there's export uh, to SDML, ODEs, uh, bitmap, SVG, graph keys, and so for publication that helps me particularly immensely for publication. So uh, one slide on mass action compiler. So uh, that procedure I discovered at the beginning of uh, compiling uh, uh, dynamical systems to, to chemical reactions and, and, uh, and DNA. So it's implemented here. You can start from a, a, a dynamical system like uh, the Lorentz scattering oscillator, which is here, um, the Lorentz extractor, and uh, um, and you can put that into you can put you stick that into a sample. So you make a sample, and in that sample you put the differential equations for the uh, uh, for the Lorentz oscillator, and then you say, okay, from sample S, apply the mass action algorithm to obtain new sample T. And what sample T does, it, sample, sample T contains pure chemical reactions, mass action, uh, that implement the same system, the same dynamical system. Now, this is non trivial because uh, the uh, Lorentz system is not mass action. Uh, this uh, negative monomial violates the uh, conditions for the algorithm to work to convert to chemical reactions. So, you need to do something a little bit more clever, but that's also algorithmically possible. And so, what this uh, thing does here. If I run the second part, it shows you the mass action chemical reaction method, which is actually produced on those non mass action ODEs. Um, and these are this one here. So it goes from three, three ODEs to um, maybe 20 chemical reactions and so on. Uh, it's interesting also because uh, uh, this is the actually running, uh, no, uh, uh, um, simulating the ODEs directly. And you can see that, uh, uh, look at the red trace. The red trace here up to up to 10 looks very much like the right trace of the of the compile system almost up to 10 uh, but there are they, they become different afterwards and that's because it's a chaotic system so up to here they're identical but it's a chaotic system so very minor uh, numerical errors uh, creep in and cause the the two systems to diverge even though you know uh, mathematically they are the same the same dynamical system so that's kind of a curiosity Okay, and finally, um, uh, random variables. So you can take uh, uh, a chemical system like Lockable Terra, uh, stick into a function which is parameterized by the rates of the reactions, R1, R2, R3, which are here. And then from this function, you can build uh, a random variable which, uh, uh, which has a sample space W, uniform sample space W, and which you can be used to vary the parameters to the function by over some uniform distributions. So this is all you have to write. You, you abstract your chemical system into uh, by parameterize the reaction, um, the reaction rates, and then you build a multivariate random variable, multivariate because this function returns two values. So it's a multivariate random variable that uh, uh, then you can uh, draw from. And if you draw 2,000 samples from this random variable, 
uh, then you automatically get uh, a, um, a density plot of the random variable, uh, of the distribution of the random variable, which tells you something about the sensitivity of this uh, system to the, to the, to the change in the parameters of one or two, or two um, uh, globally, uh, as global analysis is analysis. So anyway, so this is advanced scripting, but as you can see, it, it's, uh, it's quite compact uh, how to get. And this is thanks to this wonderful Omega language from MIT. If you don't know about it, it it's a really great thing. Uh, and I've just uh, taken their, their, their constructions. Okay, conclusions. Um, so we've seen uh, this notion of integrated modeling of chemical reaction networks and protocols, and how the Chemica app supports it. Uh, and I hope I, I explain why we need a new language for a smooth integration of all these features to make it smooth, uh, both syntactic and semantically, uh, so that all the things uh, you know, talk together in, in the right way. Uh, so the, the ideal is to achieve this notion of close group modeling and experimentation and analysis uh, for you know, complete lab automation and to allow us to scale up the scientific method for the future when we will not have uh, you know, enough people and enough lab to, to run all the experiments by hand. So uh, you can read about this in these uh, two papers and one user manual uh, up here. And many thanks to the uh, software components which I've used, uh, and uh, some also some negative thanks uh, to some other software components which I didn't like. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I can take any questions at, at this point. Thank you very much, Luca, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I too am looking forward to a fully automated lab. So one thing I'm I'm wondering about is uh, we kind of know, in particularly for volume transfers that there's uh, variability in terms of how much volume is actually transferred. And we actually have a good understanding of what that is depending on what instrument and what volume that we're transferring. So is there some way to kind of codify that into this language? Um, I'd say the same thing actually happens for concentration loss because uh, when we're working with sticky substances like DNA, we kind of know every time we do a transfer, some fraction of it uh, kind of stays on a surface. and so the volume may roughly be the same, but the concentration gets depleted. Yeah, that's, that's a very practical problem. So I, I've tried to incorporate some of that. Um, I have a couple of additional operations. Evaporation is a, is a problem, especially in, the, in digital microfluidics. And uh, you may want to have a, model, a way of, of modeling that. And so you may want to add, add some operations that, that incorporate that. It's basically, uh, there is an operation that allows to, change, to brutally change the volume of a, of a sample, an operation that brutally allows you to, to, to change the temperature of a sample. And so you can, you can interject those into your protocol and you can make them parameters and maybe you can try to infer uh, what those evaporation parameters are. Um, but uh, you know, there is no easy solution, I think, uh, because it's also very much hardware dependent. Right, so is there the ability, kind of like how you were showing, um, to be able to uh, program different distributions for, for random parameters. Could I have an understanding of which machines would be used in my lab, for instance. So if I know that the volume transfer falls within a certain bucket, kind of a certain machine or transfer method would be used and I kind of know what the tolerances would be. Um, and so I could inject to that, but if it's a different volume, then so I, I kind of want a, a programmable structure if then uh, ability. Yeah, and then you would put that into your your script uh, if you if you know if you know what's happening. So, for example, yeah, you had this uh, uh, concentrate this uh, uh, this uh, sample to a given uh, volume, which would model model evaporation or or, or dilution, uh, whatever you want to model. Um, and uh, so, but one assumption here, by the way, is that uh, the protocol operations are instantaneous. So that's another approximation, right? So the, the only the only time the only time when time passes is the equilibrate, and otherwise all the operations are assumed to be instantaneous, uh, because otherwise it's very difficult to you know figure out how to uh, how to model it. Um, so uh, and that's why you have this situ but you have this uh, situation also in digital microfluidics where you put things into the cold part and the hot part of the of the system to to shut down the reactions and so on. So that's how you model the uh, the instantaneity. But but if you if you want to also model the uh, uh, what happens between operations, uh, then you need to uh, you need to interject more equilibrates between operations at least, and try to model how those uh, uh, th those things uh, happen during the liquid handling operation. So so in the end it can become a very complicated thing. But if you if you know your equipment, you can presumably do it. Yeah. 
Terrific. Any questions from the audience? Um, hey, Luca, I have a question. Super cool language here. Um, as an experimentalist, I frequently have a problem like we design the chemical reaction or our protocol to do certain behavior. Let's say if we want oscillator to do a hundred cycles, but typically we have the problem like, I don't know, it dies in two cycles or something. <laughs> so it's wonder like, does, do you ex um, expect this to expand to like, can automatically feed it data, especially with this kind of uncertainty, would it be able to help us kind of diagnose the problem, even suggesting what kind of like uncertainty is most likely to cause the problem or even excluded us out like certain uncertainty we thought it could be, it tells us no, because some frequently we need to kind of test each one by one. It's very, very like labor intensive. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that you, you need to have a model of the chemical reactions and you, you don't know what the rates are exactly for those chemical reactions. And you also need to have a model of what happens in the, in the test tubes. And, and again, you have uncertainty about what happens there, like evaporation or whatever. And so, and then you want to wrap all that together because if you want to do inference of, uh, of the parameters, you need to take into account the uncertainties in the model and in the protocol, and you don't know which one is uh, affecting it more. So you need, you need to do inference there. So to do inference in this way, you need to have a, a single model that you can do inference on that captures both aspects, both the, the, the chemical aspects and, and the protocol aspects. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that this, you know, it's not a magical thing, but this might help in the sense of a unified way to express this, uh, this kind of uncertainties, then you can apply a routine uh, artificial intelligence algorithm to this thing and, and do inference. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can do this. Uh, so you can parameterize your, your program with, uh, with rates and express the uncertainty in terms of uh, random variables. And then you can get uh, distributions of the uncertainties. Uh, so if you, if you know your uncertainty in pipetting or whatever, uh, you can put into this random variable and then do a whole bunch of uh, runs or, of this with, with m m multiple samples, and you get the distributions of the, uh, of the random variables uh, for this particular model. And this, uh, this would include both the reactions and if you put uh, 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 protocol operations, would also include the protocol operations here. I have a quick question kind of related. Are you able to do the same or use the same random variable style for the protocol operations? So for example, if you do a split, are you able to specify a random variable that gives the ultimate split volume and then accumulate? Yeah, over? yeah, yeah, you can, you, exactly. So for example, even, even just for the time here, so the time could be also uncertain, the time of, for how long you run the simulation. So you can make this into a parameter here um, and uh, do exactly the same thing. Uh, so, and you, then you add, add one, one, uh, one parameter here, which is a, again, a, a uniform distribution for this, par for this time parameter. And now you would also be varying, varying the time of the equilibrate and you could do the same for the, for the, because the split proportion is also a parameter to the split operation. So you could do the same there. So anything, uh, you just build a random variable with, with all those uh, parameters. So this notion that, that uh, random variables are programmable, this is a great thing. And, and this is, comes from the Omega language and that's where I learned from. And it's, it's, really, it's really a great tool to, to do all these kind of things cleanly. Uh, you don't have to you know, script uh, iteration loops for, uh, for changing parameter values and so on. You just set up your random variable and you sample it. So everyone, uh, please unmute and thank Luca for the wonderful talk. Thank you, thanks. Yeah, thanks. It's interesting. Thanks, Luca.